Hi, this is Dr. Jose Barrera here in San Antonio, Texas. I just want to thank the Academy for inviting me to speak to you about augmenting the chin, choosing between chin implant versus sliding genoplasty. I'll also be speaking about other aspects of chin augmentation uh, for special conditions such as obstructive sleep apnea as well as in consideration of maxillomandibular surgery. So as in regards to disclosures, I am a consultant and grant recipient with Stryker. I have nothing to disclose in regards to that relationship because it doesn't um, uh, pertain to this talk other than I am a grant recipient and consultant with them. Or as an overview, I will discuss spatial analysis, what we describe as morphologic profiling, which is looking at soft tissue versus craniofacial skeleton of individual patients and trying to decide which operation is most appropriate. I'll discuss chin implant versus sliding genioplasty and show you some surgical cases and patient before and afters. In regards to facial analysis, we look at skeletal landmarks and what's common is to look at the cephalogram. We look at the cella tenasion to point A, which we call the infra orbitale point. Um, and then point B, which is the supramentale point. The point A is the deepest depression in the maxillary spine, and point B is the deepest depression in the mandibular body and uh, synthesis. Uh, and then we also look at the mentile, which is the inferior most point of the mandible, and the pagonia as the most anterior projection of the mandible. The S and A angle should be about 82 degrees. The S and B angle should be 80 degrees. Deficiencies in these angles per pertain to either maxillary hypoplasia or mandibular hypoplasia, or sometimes pro prognathism. We marry these skeletal landmarks with the soft tissue anatomy, looking at the nasion, the subnasale, the pagonion. We look at the Frankfurt horizontal line, which is the horizontal line drawn from the porion to the infraorbitale, and we draw a perpendicular plane from the Frankfurt horizontal line through the subnasale. And you relate deficiencies from this line to the pagonion. We also look at both skeletal and soft tissue analysis in order to determine whether there's an imbalance between the pagonion and the subnasale, and the subnasale and the menton, which should be about equal. From a skeletal relationship, from the gonium to subnasale should be about a positive six millimeters, and from the gonion to the pergonion should be about equal, plus or minus four millimeters. We describe a orthognathic or strip profile when they're in class one occlusion and a mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar interdigitates the buccal groove here in the mandibular first molar. And so you can see how the glabella relates to subnasale to this pagonion, which is a relatively straight orthognathic profile within a variance of three to four degrees. Our patient's concave, which is usually a prognathic profile, when the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar is distal, correction is mesial or anterior to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar and concave or class two when this buccal groove is more retrusive or posterior to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar. There are various types of chin implants that we can select. And as you can see here, uh, a common uh, silicone implant can be shaped in various sizes. The most common implant that I use is an extended anatomical chin implant. I also use uh, the middleman pre chin implant as well as the middleman, middleman pre mandibular implant. But there are vertical limping implants um, and also conforming implants which allow for more accommodation of irregularities in the mandible. I'll show you some of these examples. This is a patient that presents to me with uh, simple advancement. She has uh, a class one occlusion. She's been corrected with orthodontia or braces, and she really complains about this, a deficiency in the mandibular projection. 
And so she's greater than the accommodating four uh, millimeters that she should accommodate from the uh, zero meridian line. Uh, and we call this the subnasality to chin, uh, subnasality to chin point line or the Gonzales Lua reference line. If she's behind this line, more than four millimeters for female, more than three millimeters for male, then we call that a deficiency. We also look at the midline of the chin. She's slightly asymmetric, as you can see here from the nose. We can correct that asymmetry with a sliding genoplasty, but she likes to have a chin implant instead. And so this is the inclination that I spoke to you about. This is in reference to the gonzalez Lower classification. It was first described actually uh, in this paper, um, which was uh, published by Dr. Farkas in Craniofacial Norms of North American Caucasians. And in males, from the Gobella through the Zemnase Alley, you should have up to a minus three degree inclination, uh, plus or minus 3.4 degrees. And a female, the inclination of glabella through something's alley should be on average minus 4.1 in mean degrees, plus or minus three degrees. As you can see from our previous patient that she has a greater than three degree incl inclination in a negative plane. What is our technique for chin implant? We make an incision in a sub, uh, in a crease in the, behind the mentone in the uh, chin area, submental area. We dissect in a subperiosal plane, identify the mental nerve. We detach the mentalis muscle from the periosteum and then we move forward and uh, place the chin implant. We fixate the chin implant either with screw fixation or with suture fixation to the periosteum and we can contour the implant laterally. It is important to maintain at least a centimeter clearance from the submental um, correction from the mental nerve and also in relationship to the um, incisor make sure that we are at least one centimeter from the distal end of the incisor tooth if we're going to place this screw. Also screw fixation should be placed in the interdental papillae in order to avoid any kind of tooth root injury. This is the same patient as you can see here postoperatively with a better improvement in that inclination plane and a straighter jawline as a result. And this is her in the AP view. We can also perform chin augmentation uh, for patients that already have a good inclination. This patient has a slightly negative inclination. However, she has a very deep uh, pregel sulcus. And so we can place an extended anatomical chin implant in order to further disguise this pregel sulcus. This is the patient on three quarter view, and you can see a straighter jawline, and we're disguising the pregel sulcus and also camouflaging the jaw itself. Same patient in the frontal view with a very deep pregel sulcus and very heavy jaw on both sides with improvement with an extended anatomical chin implant of the jawline. This patient obviously would benefit from a facelift, but she did not even like to do so. This is a patient in which we perform a facelift surgery on. The patient had extensive jowling and blitzable banding, uh, also um, had extensive uh, malar hypoplasia and very deep marionettes. And secondary to this redundancy and this um, uh, lack of defined jawline, uh, we went ahead and elected to do a deep plane facelift and place a middleman pre jaw implant, which both augments anteriorly as well as helps define the jawline laterally. And this is the patient preoperatively and postoperatively showing good jawline, straighter jawline, improving the marionettes and improving the neckline. This is her three quarter view showing a straighter jawline here and improvement in this platysmal banding, pre-jaw sulcus, and the jaw itself. And this is her lateral view. Another patient presented for facelift surgery, but the patient has extensive pre-jaw sulcus, a very tethered mandibular cutaneous ligament, which is released as part of the deep plane facelift. 
uh, in order to improve the giles as well as the pregenal sulcus. But you need a little bit extra augmentation here. But she is older. She has suffered some bony uh, resorption in this area. And so we wanted to augment the pregenal sulcus with an, with an implant. And we elected to also place an extended anatomic, anatomical chin implant in order to improve this pregenal sulcus as part of her facelift. So there may be complications associated with chin implants. There may be complications associated with sliding genoplasties. And so the, this paper really highlights that um, whether you choose osseous genoplasty or implant placement, it's uh, careful planning and it's very technique oriented. And so foundational anatomic uh, anatomy needs to be exercised uh, in, disse in dissecting the planes accurately in order to perform these operations without complications. This is a patient that suffered a complication and was referred to me, had an operation performed in New York, came down to Texas, had a previous chin implant and angle implants, and had tooth erosion secondary to an implant placed in the chin. Um, he had cortical resorption and uh, asymmetry still present I elected to remove the chin implant and place an iliac bone graft as well as a sliding genoplasty to correct the deficiency that remained. So even with this chin implant, he had persistent pre sulcus, but had osseous resorption for the chin implant. So I removed it, removed the angle implants, performed the sliding genoplasty, iliac crest bone marrow placement, and um, to correct the cortical resorption of the tooth. And the patient did well post-operatively. I've written extensively about skeletal surgery for obstructive sleep apnea and sleep medicine, otolaryngology, and in plastic surgery, and specifically orthognathic surgery uh, with our latest article in 2020, and describe our technique for sliding genoplasty versus MMA, maximum mandibular advancement, and genoglossal advancement, and I'd like to briefly discuss some of these. Sliding genoplasty, is advantageous in addressing not just anterior projection, but under projection, asymmetry, over projection, and vertical height disparities, secondary to transverse asymmetries, which can be seen in the chin. Sliding geoplasty can be combined with rhinoplasty and maximum mandibular advancement and other surgeries at the same time in order to improve the subnasality to pagonion uh, angulation, which I previously described. Asymmetry can be corrected with sliding genoplasty as depicted here by this article in Archives of Facial Plastic Surgery by Dr. Chan. This is a patient midline asymmetry. As you can see here, much, very significant asymmetry of the chin point as well as a anterior deficiency on the projection. Perform, I perform a sliding genoplasty and rhinoplasty and you can see the correction in the asymmetry uh, by performing a sliding genoplasty and also correction in the, in, in the lack of under projection or the, the lack of anterior projection, under projection in the patient. This is 13 months post-op. We can also take this patient that seems more convex and make it more orthognathic by combining it with a rhinoplasty surgery. This is a patient that comes in with a very convex nose uh, with a very uh, small chin, even though she has class one occlusion. This six months after surgery, performing a rhinoplasty with a sliding genoplasty, correcting the anterior disparity that um, she showed, the significant under projection, but also making her more orthognathic in structure by combining it with a rhinoplasty surgery. And you can see here the angulation of the, of the mandible where it looked more steep, it's now more uh, in plane. And so you can see improvement in the uh, jawline as well with a sliding genoplasty because we are rotating the mandible uh, in a counterclockwise rotation with a sliding genoplasty. You can see here the improvement in the angulation as well, whereas before she had an angulation which was greater than five degrees. Now this angulation is reduced to about two degrees to three degrees in negative angulation. So she's much more orthognathic in profile. This is her three quarter view and you can see the anterior projection of the mandible 
as well as the inc inclination of the mandible, which shows improvement in her overall craniofacial profile. This is her uh, front view as well. This is a patient who came to me for revision rhinoplasty, uh, but she was very concave. She, uh, again, had been corrected secondarily with orthodontia braces, but still had maxillary hypoplasia. The nose was also slightly saddled, and the patient was very prognathic in, in regards to the chin point. So she's overprojected. We performed a sliding genoplasty setback, whereby I made the patient, patient more orthodontic. As you can see, her inclination here, she's very positive. Instead of being negative four degrees, she's positive five, six degrees here. And now here she's within norms, positive about four degrees uh, in the anterior view. We also made her nose, her rhinoplasty straight, correcting the saddle, and also gave her some maxillary projection by adding some fillers such as sculpture in this area in order to give her some projection of the cheek. Alternatively, we could choose a chin implant, uh, excuse me, alternatively, we could have chosen a, excuse me, a malar implant, not a chin implant, because a chin implant, implant would not make the uh, chin point. We could not set that back. However, a malar implant could augment the, the cheek. However, this patient would like to have uh, fillers with a rhinoplasty and a sliding genoplasty setback. This is her three-quarter view. You see the cleft to chin is now improved. It's much more supple. And this is her front view. She's still a little bit swollen from the rhinoplasty as she's uh, just uh, with, within six months of her surgery. This is a patient presents to us now with a sliding genoplasty and a rhinoplasty for obstructive sleep apnea. She is a little bit older patient, but at four months we can get a, a very extraordinary result without doing a facelift on her. She looks much more rested because we cured her sleep apnea by improving the airway. And this is her operation here, which I will show you. So here's her sliding genoplasty. We use a, a reciprocate, a sagittal saw here, followed by um, screw fixation of the distal portion. We use an L plate. We secure the su superior aspect of the plate with 2.0 millimeter screws and an interdental papillae. We advance the chin and fixate it with 2.0 millimeter screws and then use a pair of burr to taper the edges. This is again, we mark the midline and the interdental papillae. We mark the midline with a sagittal saw. We cut the initial anterior body of the mandible, the cortex with a sagittal saw, and then cut the posterior cortex with a reciprocating saw. It is important to uh, mark out your midline before you make this osteotomy cut so you can uh, ascertain what correction you want to achieve. Again, distal uh, proximal screw fixation to the midline and distal screw fixation here uh, as well with an L plate and 2.0 millimeter screws. This is her uh, profile view. This is postoperatively after rhinoplasty and a sliding genoplasty about six millimeters, improving the neckline, improving the airway, and also improving her obstructive sleep apnea. This is a patient again with three quarter view, an improvement in the jawline and the neck. The other three quarter view. Another patient presenting for sliding genoplasty, three month post op. He just had a midline. Deficiency in the chin point. This is in three quarter view and profile view, correcting this significant negative disparity in inclination to within normal from the Sublinese alley to the Pagonia. He's within normal inclination now. Another patient sliding genoplasty advancement for correct, correcting this significant negative inclination uh, to the normal inclination. You can see here, a uh, very natural result. There are other operations that can be performed, such as a genoglossal advancement, whereby instead of removing the most distal portion, advancing the genial hard muscle, now we're advancing the genial glossus muscle. 
And this can be performed in order to improve sleep apnea, but it also can improve aesthetics. He said she will make it a bicortical osteotomy of the mandible or advance in the genohyoid muscle and the genoglossus muscle. And we're improving the airway from a small airway here in the posterior airway space to a larger posterior airway space area. You can see here small posterior airway space is courtesy of my mentor, Dr. Nelson Powell, to a larger posterior airway space just by moving the genoglossus. This is how we do that case. Essentially, we typically start this case off because these are typically sleep apnea case. With a sleep endoscopy, we use profile titration. We do all our genoclasses, advancements, and, and sliding genoclasses with this. This is a very obstructive airway. We do a nasal intubation. And then after the nasal intubation, we perform the operation. Again, we're going to make an incision along the genial, uh, along the sulcus, above the genial space. We're going to reset, cut through the metallus muscle, use a sagittal saw to cut. Now, the instead of the most inferior portion, we're going to cut a bicortical box, which is one centimeter above the distal mandible and one centimeter below the tooth roots. We're going to advance this bicortical aspect, exposing both genial high and genial colossus cut off the excess mandibular uh, bone, and we can leave some for anterior projection. And then we're gonna use one suture, excuse me, one screw, one screw fixation from the anterior body of the mandible to the most inferior portion of the mandible. This is the operation depiction um, as published by us in 2016. Um, uh, and in this paper, we measured the tension to width ratio, the tension to the tongue, to advancing to the advanced, advancement by cortical segment. And we were able to demonstrate that we can actually get improvement, significant improvement in sleep apnea by doing this. And the whole principle of doing this is this tension, string tension theory. As we pull this genoglossus muscle forward, we're actually opening up the airway and there is a tension to length ratio of this bicortical uh, mandible to the tension of the tongue attached to it, which results in uh, significant improvement in sleep apnea. This has been described for modification for also for aesthetics in the general cranial maxillofacial surgery, whereby this genoglossus advancement can be stepwise advanced with a genoglossus, uh, with a genoglossus advancement and a sliding geoplasty in order to improve the aesthetics of the chin. We can also combine this with a maximum mandibular advancement. Uh, so sliding geoplasty or a mortise geoplasty, a much higher cut uh, with a Lefort 1 osteotomy and bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. And in my hands, I typically will use a genoglossal advancement with a Lefort 1 and a sagittal split in order to get a three different planes of advancement of the craniofacial skeleton. This is a patient that I presented and published on who was trait dependent and necessitated maximum mandibular advancement. We performed a before one osteotomy with down fracture, sagittal split osteotomy, and geoglossal advancement in order to cure him of his sleep apnea, followed by rhinoplasty and costal cartilage grafting. This is pre up, patient has significant maxillary hypoplasia. The patient had uh, performed an intermediate maxillary before one advancement of 10 millimeters with a three millimeter impaction. And then a sagittal split osteotomy, whereby I perform a counterclockwise rotation of the mandibular body by 10 millimeters. This is in preoperatively, had a significant saddle nose, trait dependent, as you can see here, you barely see the trait collar. And after the Fort one osteotomy, sagittal split osteotomy, geoglass advancement, I perform a augmentation rhinoplasty with costal cartilage grafting and ala base reductions. This is him with a significantly saddle nose, preoperatively before maxillary augmentation and genial augmentation, and then afterwards with rhinoplasty. This is before and after view. This is his other profile view, showing a much better relationship in the maxilla, mandible, as well as the, as well as the nose. This is three-quarter view. The other three-quarter view, I just want to thank you again 
uh, for allowing me to present this uh, series uh, discussing the differences between chin implant versus sliding genoplasty, as well as taking it a step further and discussing other applications and skeletal surgery. You can reach me at, at drjoseburro.com. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much.